and we'll be picking up uh, when we get to Judah's prophecy in verse 8. That's where um, the fresh, the new will be that I'm going to review real quickly, just short, just highlights, boom, 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 because it, the whole chapter is that prophetic chapter of the 12 cents that spans time. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Three, two. It is Wednesday afternoon, August 7th. We're picking up in bear sheet, Genesis chapter 49. We'll start word by word in verse 8, but we'll back up in just a quick review of verses 1 through 7. We are coming to the end of our book, but remember, this is called the beginning. So we're only coming to the end of the beginning. <laughs> We've got a long ways to go, so much more. Uh, in, the, in the start of this chapter, we saw that Yaakov, knowing that he is soon to pass away, and this is not his imagination, this is reality, uh, he wants to bring his sons together and pour out that fatherly blessing over his sons that in, in Jewish homes, this is just what is death. I don't even want to call it tradition. It's just fact. This is what is death. So he gathered them together, but it's interesting that our prophecy immediately turns to end times. It's the first time that we saw the words uh, uh, that it's the Akharet Hayamim, the end days or the end of times. We saw that usually that refers to tribulation time through the millennium. And uh, even though we see prophecy being fulfilled up toward that time in this chapter, it definitely deals all the way through into the millennial reign of Messiah. That's the great hope of Israel. The promise to Israel throughout the ages has been that the coming of Messiah and his kingdom Remember, our Jewish people as a whole, as a nation, did not recognize Messiah in his first coming because it came suffering. They were looking for a ruling king. They're still looking for that. So they're looking for that kingdom promise. It was something that, that was very much spoken of by the prophets continually to the point that Yeshua's Talmud and his followers, they even asked him, is it time now? Is it, will the kingdom be now? And we know that it doesn't come even past 2,000 years from then because we're in that time now. And we we know we're close, but we have to have a seven-year tribulation first, and then we go into millennial reign where Messiah will return second coming in in uh, in, in ruling, in royalty, and what's the word I want? Power. Uh, but we'll even hit on that in the prophecy, so I, I won't say any more about it now. In the first prophecy given to Reuben, the firstborn son, who normally would get the birthright, double blessing, double responsibility, etc., we see that because of his uh, his indiscretion, I'll put it that way, going up to his father's uh, handmaid's wife's handmaid and having relations with her, that it disqualified him. We saw that the firstborn of Rachel, Rachel, is the one who is picked up in that position that is none other than Yosef. He receives a double portion in essence through his two sons, Ephraim and Manashe, Ephraim and Manasseh, who are brought in as sons, not as grandsons, to make up the 12 tribes and to uh, be spoken of prophetically in that sense. Um, we'll look at a map in just a bit, not yet, but I decided it'd be good to have a map of the divisions of the 12 tribes because this does refer to where they will go in the land when they come in. Uh, it's going to be 400 years plus from now because that was prophesied. They'd go down into Egypt, they'd be there 400 years, and then Moshe would be raised up and it'd still be a number of years before they would finally enter into the promised land. But we're talking about that division then. We're not talking about the millennial reign and the division at that time. So Reuben, Reuben lost his preeminence and dignity and power uh, because he was uncontrollable, everything, uh, the instability like water, boiling water that boils over, et cetera, et cetera. We talked about that in detail. I remember just hitting the highlights right now. Uh, but he did decrease in number and he didn't no, no uh, kings come from him no priests come from him nothing that would show dignity or power he just he exists but that's that's it um in fact in later wars with the canonites he almost caused a civil war uh there just isn't anything good to say about him uh that glory just uh dried up, you know, it was no king, no prophet, no judge came from him. Then we looked at Shimon and Levi, the two brothers that were the, apparently the closest, but they were cohorts in war and they were both very cruel. Um, they showed that cruelty to the Shechemites that they uh, slaughtered. 
Yes, it was in defense of their sister Dina, but it still was done with great cruelty and it wasn't done um, in an abort, up, 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 how do you say that? Above, above board. Above, above board. board, thank you. Above the way above that it above should above. be. Yes, like above approach, yes. So they also weren't moved into that firstborn position because remember that carries with it the spiritual uh, leadership of the family also. So we saw that more importantly, that would come through Yosef, who we see stand for the Lord, no matter what happened in his life, even when he went into slavery, even when he was thrown in the pit, even when he was raised up and in times when often people, when they are being, being blessed, that's when they forget the Lord, Yosef never did. Great example of Messiah. We saw that in what, 87 points we saw through the, our study in, in Bereshit. So he is the worthy one in that area. Uh, of Shimon, Simeon and Levi, or Levi, uh, we saw that they would be warring tribes, and we saw that was very much what they were like. But the Levites, the Le Levitical tribe, had a, uh, what's the word I want? They were given, um, they were redeemed a bit because they stepped up and took out their brothers and neighbors and others when the golden calf incident had happened. And Moshe said, whoever's on the Lord's side, stand here now and then go out and war and kill those who were involved in that horrible, horrible turning back into idolatry in such a short time when Moshe was getting those commandments from God. And uh, God took that and recognized that they were the ones, that tribe were, was willing to take the stand even against their brothers and to take that stand for God. So he did reward them with the fact that the uh, priestly tribe would come from them rather than from the firstborn of each family. It would come from the Levitical tribe. So we saw that they get blessed um, in, in that way. It is interesting, though, because the... The fault of Levi is brought out how uh, he how how much warring how do you say wars they they were in the bad sense too that someone even said this is what proves the word of God because Moshe is from the tribe of Levi and if he wasn't being divinely inspired by God why would he put down the negative about his own he probably would have left that out just just an interesting side note. Uh, but in verse 6, it said that they would not enter into council, that uh, the Hebrew says, let not my glory be united with their company. So they would not be brought in a way that, that they would be respected in that sense. Uh, but they do get redeemed in the priestly end of uh, their tribal uh, offspring. I think you understand what I'm trying to say. In verse 7, we're told that God was going to disperse these two tribes. And we see that it did happen that both of them scattered throughout Israel. Shimeon ends up in Judah's territory um, and even scattered within Judah's territory. Little's heard from them after that time. They've maybe even pretty much assimilated in Judah's tribe, except we know God keeps each tribe separate enough to call 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes in the time of the tribulation, the book of Revelation that we read about. But in the first numbering with Moshe, Shimeon um, it was larger number. He became, I think it's something like 63% less by the second um, um, <laughs> counting, the second numbering, sorry. Uh, numbers 26, if you want to look at it, it tells you, just to give you an example, the tribe of Reuben had 43,000. Shimeon was down to 22,000. They were the third largest when they, they came out from Egypt. But 35 years later, approximately, time of wilderness wanderings, getting ready to go to the promised land. Yes, they're 63% less of their tribe. They're down to 22,000. Let's look at numbers 26, 26. Numbers 26. Yes, if you start with verse 14, um, you go through it, you'll see. I could read you numbers. I can read them quickly. There's no point in you trying to write them down. They're all recorded for you in that chapter. But uh, Reuben had 43,000. Shimon had 22,000. I'll say Gad, but Hebrew pronounces it God. It's just not God. It's G-A-D, 40,000. Judah had 76,500. Yisachar had 64,300, Zebulon had 60,500, Manasseh had 52,700, 
Ephraim is the next closest to, to uh, Shion in size, 32,500. So he still had more than 10,000 than the other. I'll finish and I'll get your question. Uh, if Benjamin had 45,600. The tribe of Dan or Don in pronunciation, 64,400. Ashur had 53,400 and Naphtali had 40, 45,400. So you can see the majority of them were, were 10, 20,000 bigger than Shimeon and even Ephraim who's small like him together. 601,730. And these are the men that were counted for war. This isn't counting mamas and children. Question. That, that, that's, I was going to say, yes. Is that how many people, men, were ready to go? Yes. Sons of Israel to go to war. Yes. And why did they, they count it or were counted ever so often? Why do we count our census today? <laughs> <laughs> Why do we count census today? Um, there was a time when God told them not to number. They weren't to number their military because they would look at the numbers of their military and not at God and trust God. Yeah. Maybe it is just given to us to show that they did grow in size. God promised Abraham, you'll be large. You'll have you know, all of these and, and what would come from them, kings and judges and so forth. So maybe it's just to show the faithfulness of the word of God to show his faithfulness, to carry uh, the name down separately, even though we know nothing today, unless you're called Levi or Cohen, you don't know what tribe you're from. You may have a, my family says so, but you have nothing of proof because the records were destroyed in 70 AD, but yet God is keeping those numbers because he's going to bring out 12,000 out of each to be his evangelist, to take the gospel out to the ends of the earth. So to God is important. And it wasn't looking at it as a way of pride. It would be looking at God's blessing. Oh, I was just going to say that, you know, the numbers even benefit us today with the learning, that with the studying, it, it shows us. I mean, so much stuff got documented right. in Scripture. Right. And that's really important. Would we know that Shion had diminished? Would we know that judgment as God had said had been carried out without the numbers? No, we really wouldn't have. I mean, what, what other, um, I'm going I'm to use the word religion broadly, what other religion has all of their stuff documented as well? None of them do. No. no and they they're don't. always trying to change their story to... To fit what their need is or what they're trying to put forward yeah. at the time. Right, right, yeah. And really, I think also we have to realize keeping these tribal records kept the records that also included the proof of Messiah's line. And that had to be so he could prove he was Messiah. That's why he had to come before the records were destroyed. No one could prove today that they are the Messiah by genealogical records. In fact, only by what they would say, that no one could prove it. You know, if someone stepped up today and said, I am Messiah, and we said, prove it, give us your genealogical record, take it all the way back. I got to see that you came from David and, and so forth. No one could do that. So the scripture, the word of God does enable that to be that. And Yeshua came in time, they could have called him out if he was not the Messiah, but they could not because he was. And was it 70 AD roughly when it got Probably. Yes, yes, okay. 70 AD, the, the they, final right. destruction of the temple. The records were at the temple, so those those records were destroyed at that time. And Titus's intent was to annihilate the Jewish race. He wanted to wipe the Jews off the face of the earth. He took what he thought was the last of the living Jews, and he marched them to Rome, took them through the Arch of Titus, that triumphal arch, as he called it, because to him, that was where the Jewish population was going to finally be be ended and instead God had that final say and 2,000 years later a little less than that 1900 and some years later two Jewish people with four Jewish feet stood in that arch of Titus and instead of facing Rome turned to face Jerusalem had a picture taken with the flag raised and said we're Jewish Titus didn't end us and we have that victory so it's important it's it's critically important to the historical records to the prophetic records, to God's plan being proven on every level. And that's also in the Babylonian time. You know, they never did that. The censor, those who passed away, whatever, that's why there's a big deal in 2020. But now they are really watching the census of every state of who passed, who done, 
it's about time to keep an eye on that. That's their job. And they do that for purposes of, of representation, of taxation, of di divisions of land, et cetera, et cetera. But we're talking about what's the purpose of that. I don't think that's Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that's always been a tool when you try to destroy the people is to destroy the history. Yes, absolutely. And that's why when Daniel was taken in, yes, yes. And why when Daniel was taken into captivity, they changed his name even because his name was part of his identity and they wanted to, to wipe out as much as they could, but they didn't succeed and they never will succeed because God has that final word. Uh, but even those who like, you know, like Libby, who felt the, the strong hand of the Lord in judgment, as they clung to the Lord, as we see the, the Levites clinging to the Lord, we see that the Lord does bring redemption. We see them strengthened from that time. And we could learn from that, that even if it's a hand of correction, it's better to draw close to that hand of correction than to try to flee from it or not adhere the lesson that we're to be learning. So I think we see a lot in, in why God gives us this detail. We can study it from every angle and find a purpose and a reason for it, even in the numbering. So, but I think we are ready to move on into our new, which is the uh, prophecy for Judah or for Judah. Uh, this prophecy is very important because someone very important comes through this line. I think we all know who. <laughs> That's our very Messiah and Savior. If you don't know, let me say it. It's Yeshua Jesus. But let's read what it says about Judah. It starts off and says, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Well, that's very much what his name means. Judah is praise. When we sing praise ye the Lord, we say Judah let out. You don't say the J in Hebrew. It's a record of his past of Judah. That's why God chose him. For the line of Jesus is a Judah uh, He was one of the the good guy, <laughs> one of the better, yeah. one of the more obedient. Um, well, we see others who were disqualified. And yes, for whatever reason, God did choose for for Messiah's line to come through the son Judah, through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and now uh, Judah for the Messianic genealogy. Um, and we see a lot promised in Judah that tells us that. But when you ask me, why were they chosen? I can't say they're chosen. Yes, they were deserving of it, where like Shimon was not. Yuda was deserving of it, but it's also God's um, preeminent, supreme will and plan that put it into motion. So both well, sides. Well, he knows he knows all. That's why he don't raise up and bring down both good and evil for his purposes, because he knows a heart that won't turn to him and he'll use it in that manner, as well as a heart that does turn to him. Uh, but looking at this, this tribe, we're going to see quickly that prophecy goes beyond Judah or Judah, however you want to pronounce it, all the way to Messiah. It's not going to stop just here. It's not going to stop just with this tribe. This is going to continue on. So what's prophesied about him starting at this point? It says, your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. When it's on the neck, that's a picture of conquering, that, that they would conquer their enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down to you. Okay, the enemies are going to be defeated. That means they're a powerful leader. Uh, and let me also say, too, when I say it's going to take time to be completely fulfilled, we'll see in the tribe of Judah, we'll see when we come like to David, we see David very much as a strong leader, very much getting rid of the enemies of Israel. But we see the greatest fulfillment in Messiah, not at his first coming, but at his second coming when he puts a stop to all the enemies of Israel. At that time when Messiah comes in that second coming, all the enemies will come gather together against Israel. She will be standing alone at that time. When I say alone, I mean from other countries in the world. God is on her side. That's why one country against them all can win because little David against Goliath is nothing when God is with you. That's just the, the fact. So we're seeing that Messiah will be that deliverer that will deliver Israel from all her enemies. Ah, oh, on a day like today, I can hardly wait to see Israel get to this point. So the enemies will be destroyed. 
um, Yuda will be be that head. Your um, and your father's sons bowing down to you speaks of chief rulership. Um, it shows them as a prince. It doesn't show them as the king because the king is Messiah himself, is God himself. But let me show you. Let me take you to First Chronicles five two. First Chronicles chapter five and verse two. Okay, there we go. First Chronicles 5, sorry, I'll get there. And verse 2. Here's your answer right there. There's my who? The answer why God chose you. Yes, okay. And good, good. Thank you for pointing that out. Though Judah prevailed over his brothers, and from him came the leader. No, no, no. That's not answering your question. Not why God favored him? But when he was over his brothers, he was showing favor from God. He was shown favor from God, but he doesn't say because he did. See, sometimes it's, it's God's choice, and yeah. he's in line with that, and God does know who to choose. Yeah. So, okay, so though Judah prevailed over his brothers, and from him came the leader, yet the birthright belonged to Joseph. Okay, that leader, that comes from him. We are, I'm, I'm tipping my hand if you don't know. We already know that's Messiah. Messiah is a great leader who would come from Judah, who would be the chief ruler. As it says, if you have the old King James Version, it calls him there, the chief ruler. When it says, um, what does it say in this one in verse 2? It just says king the leader. It says the chief ruler in the old King James. If I take you into the Hebrew, the word is Nagid, N-A-G-I-D. To give you a rough way to spell it in our English, but it means prince. Now it's the same word in Daniel nine twenty five, where prince there we know means Messiah. So if you keep it in its context, you keep it in Daniel. You use it the same way here in Genesis. It's talking about the prince who would come, the prince, Sar Shalom, the prince of peace. One of the names that uh, Yeshua Isaiah gives for Messiah also. And we see, too, that he's called a ruler by Micah, the prophet Micah. In chapter 5 and verse 2, it says that he would have rule, he would have dominion, he would reign. It's a different word there, but the idea behind this is that the patriarchal, the, the, the dominion of the patriarchs, this will come from this one. This is the responsible one. This is the one that will have um, that position normally of a firstborn, and even though Yuda was not chosen as firstborn in that birthright. He was cho as chosen as firstborn in position, in rank, in bringing forth Messiah, who also is ranked first, only begotten Son of God. Not firstborn, but first in position. Because Messiah was never, well, Yeshua was the, the, the born form of God that was never born is what I'm trying to say. That's why you can't say those who try to say God and Yeshua Jesus are not equal. This is where they try to say it. And they try to say, see, he's a born one. He was born like Satan. He was, well, Satan wasn't even born that way. He was born like Adam. But no, his flesh was born. But his spirit, who he was, existed as Micah, Micah 5, 2 said, from eternity past that he's always been. So it's talking about a position. It's talking about a rank that he is in that first position, only begotten. It's a higher rank than all else. He's the first fruits that we follow from of resurrection from the dead in that human flesh that was given that abundant life that we're promised when we cross over into eternity with the Lord also. We will live on forever. We won't die either. But uh, but again, we were born. He wasn't just his flesh. Yeah, he, the only kind. He became flesh. He became flesh. But before that, he already existed. Before exactly. Beginning. Exactly. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was yeah. with God. The Word was God. Yeah. And we know the Word is Yeshua. We know the Word is the Son. We know the Word is that second part of the triunity of our God that we refer to as the Son of God. We know that's what came and dwelt among us in, in John 1, 14. I quoted John 1, 1 a moment ago in verse 14 that says he tabernacled with us. But it shows very clearly 
he existed always. His existence didn't begin at that point in time. So we're looking at a dominion, we're looking at a, a responsibility, a rank, a position. We're not looking at a birth when we're talking about Messiah of old, the Messiah who is deity with God. I think I can say it that way. Go ahead. So I have a comment that's kind of off topic that I've thought of many times when it talks about Jesus humbled himself. It's, it's almost hard for me to imagine. He literally went from what he had in heaven to becoming a human baby. Yes, in a womb. And so his, growing conscious, and... his consciousness level when he was born right. would have <laughs> literally been a baby. Yes. He would have literally had to, you would have to completely 100% trust God to take care of you because you'd be totally helpless as a baby. And that also puts him in the trust of an earthly father and mother. Yeah. You know, and he, to me, that's actually hard to wrap my mind. Uh, yes, very much. So very much, yes. The vulnerability, the... the um, and probably that's... someday in heaven we'll probably find out all the times that Satan tried to get him during that vulnerable time. Right, from the beginning. Yes, yes. Yeah, and, and I think often, too, <laughs> the... the the one who created, because we know Colossians and Genesis both tell us the Son was involved in the creation of this world. The one who created everything, he keeps it in order to enter into his creation any form that confines him. You know, he chose that. He wasn't confined, excuse me, prior to taking on that human body. And yet he chose that for all of eternity because he's never going to slip out of that human body that perfected human body. When he rose from the dead, he was flesh and bone. The blood was gone. In this life, the life of the flesh is in the blood. In the eternal, it is not. But he, it just blows my mind. I, I just see someone, I, again, I use the same expression. I need more expressions. But <laughs> I see the ocean. And it's like we, we see it being brought down to this little cup to contain. Well, obviously, that cup can't contain the ocean. So when you get a cup full of ocean, that's all you get. In essence, he took from that and brought himself down to this. That blows my mind. And willingly did it. Came to die. Blows my mind. Amazing. Amazing grace. Amazing love. Amazing plan. Magnificent plan. And I just stand in awe. And I think if I catch this much on a human level, wait till I have the mind of, of Messiah then. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we have to have new bodies because this would just explode in his presence. Um, back on, though, since we want to uh, get through with Genesis, not in essence get through, but you know what I'm saying. Um, let's look at that line of Judah because we, we have an interesting picture that's given to us starting right here with the next phrase. Yuda is a lion's well. Um, you might have cup. Well born cup. Yes, that's what I meant. Back to verse nine. That's a young lion cup, the 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 baby growing up. So if we look at this in the time for Yuda in youth, we would look at the day, say, from Yahshua to Saul, from the time when they enter into the promised land to the time of having the first king. Um, this tribe is developing in power. It's not predominant, but Judah is, is developing its position of power and strength during those years. So it starts out, as said here, is a lion's whelp. Then it says, from the prey, my son, you have gone up. From the prey speaks of conquering. The lion's gone out now, gotten older, learned, and now is coming into more power and has been able to conquer. He's gone up. He's arisen. So now we're beginning to see Judah as a strong tribe, as a courageous tribe, as a tribe that is victorious. The next phrase, keep following that line, says, he couches, or you may have crouches, it depends on your version, he lies down as a lion and as a lion who dares rouse him up. Well, when you see that he lies down as a lion, when he stoops down, the Hebrew says, he's crouching like a mature lion that's resting in his den. So he's gone from youthful that needed to grow to becoming the one who is powerful, who could uh, 
take out his enemy who could feed himself, take care of himself. And now we're seeing him in a mature form where he's got his den and he's he's the, the head of that den and he's able to rest. He has others who do warring for him, but he's grown in his power. And it's believed that this would be referring to the time of David because David comes from the tribe of Judah. David was a conqueror. David took out many enemies, but then David had that time when he reigned as king. So it's looked on that we're looking at that time. If so, just to come to David from where we are now is taking 640 years to fulfill that prophecy. But if you want to see the full layers, if you want to see the full depth, we know this prophecy because we know Messiah comes from the tribe of Judah. So we know it's referring to his being that mature, that one that, that has all under his control, who he is, the lion, the king of the jungle, so to speak. If we're looking at that with Messiah, it's going to be 1,600 years before Messiah comes. It's going to be even longer before we see that complete fulfillment. So this is an amazing prophecy that stretches thousands of years. I see it in both. I see it foreshadowing David as he is a picture of Messiah. I see it in Messiah's first coming when he conquers sin for all mankind forever. And I see it in his second coming when he comes and rules and reigns with Israel's head nation and the rest of the world all comes up and worships him. None that come against him at that time. So whichever way you see it, I see thousands of years to fulfill this prophecy. And I see it amazing. We'll see that when we study Daniel also. Daniel will get into that great prophecy in chapter 9 that goes over thousands of years. That at, at their time, all they can see is the closeness. But it's like looking at mountain peaks. When I look at a distance, it looks like those mountain peaks are right on top of each other. But if I go drive from that mountain peak to the next mountain peak, there's a long ways in between. That's what we're seeing. Long ways in between, but we're getting our mountain peaks right now. So he's a lion that's crouched down, that's stooped down, that's matured, that's resting. And as a lion, it goes on to say, this would be the old lion. It also is a picture of the lioness in Hebrew who protects her brood. So she's fierce. She's defending her young. You don't get near mama lion when she's got her little babies around is showing power and showing strength but as it ages it's showing declining if we look at that as a picture of israel and israel's history i would look at that as the, the end of solomon's reign because david set him up solomon started out well but by the time solomon's ending we're going to have the divided kingdom come after that we never see israel united in the power that she was under david under david so i see you can look at the age of the lion. You can look at it through the, the tribes to Solomon's day, or you can take it all the way to the end. But in the end, we don't see Messiah ever as one that, that begins those waning years. He never does. So that's why I don't take that part to the end. I take that part just to, like I say, maybe Solomon's reign. The last time when, when Israel was united as the 12 tribes, before she divided and from there goes off into Assyrian captivity, Babylon in captivity, et cetera, et cetera. But who dares rouse her up? Or does it say him up? I think it says him. Yeah, who, who dares rouse him up? That would speak of the rest that when you were within his den, you felt secure. There was a stronghold there. Nothing would disturb. Nobody come against that king of the jungle when he's in his prime. But speaking of that time, and in that, again, I see fully the picture of Messiah. When he comes as the lion of the tribe of Judah, he's going to demand respect. He's showing strength. He's showing majesty. You can read of him in Revelation 5. Yes, as, a, as the lamb who was slain, but you see him now as the roaring lion of the tribe of Judah. You see majesty. You see power. You see king of the jungle. And the only time in Israel's history I see that where Israel would be that strong is only in Messiah, only with Messiah ruling and reigning as king of kings, Lord of lords, more than king of the jungle. But I'll say it's a jungle down here. <laughs> so the king of the, the, the jungle in that way. Now, thinking of that, that phrase especially telling us 
what he's like as Messiah, I think fits in perfectly when we keep it in context and move into verse 10. Verse 10 says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Okay, the scepter was the tribal rod or the staff of office. It was an ensign that showed authority. The king held out the scepter to Queen Esther. Remember, she said, if he doesn't hold out the scepter, I'm dead. So that scepter is the sign of who's who, the one holding that scepter and holding it out or not is the king, is the one that has that power, that rulership, that regal command. Uh, when we look at that, let me take you real quick to Numbers, Bar, Numbers 24. And I'm going to take you to uh, verse 17 and 19. Numbers 24, 17. And I think this is critical to understand this verse also. Numbers 24, 17 is prophetic. It's coming from one who wanted to curse Israel. All he can do when he opened his mouth is bless Israel. I love it. God's in control. And he even said before he gave the prophecy, he was being hired to curse Israel, that he told the one who was hiring him that I can only say what God lets me say. He knew there was one who controlled. Um, in verse 17, chapter 24, Numbers, it says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. A scepter shall rise from Israel. Okay, we've got the scepter right here. Um, we've talked a bit about the star. Um, when I uh, gave you the prince, the one, the star shalom, the, the prince of peace, the star that's rising, um, let me not confuse you. Let me stay on track for a moment. If I leave something out, ask me a question. A scepter shall rise from Israel and shall crush through the forehead of Moab, that's Israel's first enemy, and tear down all the sons of Shet. Okay, so we see ultimate power there, ultimate rule. Verse 19 says, One from Jacob shall have dominion and will destroy the remnant from the city. Okay, so again, knowing this to be Messiah, it's Messiah who's going to have that kind of power who with the scepter, with the rule, when he comes showing himself as the ruler, as the authority, as the king of the jungle, as the, the reigning king that Israel expected when he came that first time and did not do that in their, well, that he didn't do that because that wasn't his role. But that's what it's showing. That's telling us, and what I, what I love about this also, the star shall come forth from Yaakov, from Jacob. There are those who try to say that the Star of David is a bad sign. They try to give an evil connotation today. It's right here in scripture, folks. It comes from right here. That star that rises up is a picture of Messiah. Did he come from Yaakov? Yes, he came from that line. He came through the regal line of David. It fits the whole picture. He is the one with the scepter. When he has the scepter, there will be tranquility, or when he shows that he has the scepter on this earth there will be tranquility. That's when he will rule with a rod of iron. He will rule and the, the nations will bow. That's what we're told. That will come in millennial reign. So when we see the scepter, we see it talking about millennial reign, not just David's reign, not just Solomon's or any of the others. It's going to go all the way to Messiah's reign to be completely fulfilled as it's saying here. But what's very interesting in this prophecy, going back to Genesis, to chapter 49 and to verse 10, is it gives the, uh, another phrase about the scepter. It says that the scepter shall not depart from Judah, or Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. Let me break that down for you, and then we'll get our whole sentence. Judah would remain as a tribe. It would remain distinct. It would have authority until Shiloh comes. This Shiloh is the one that he's talking about, the one that has the scepter the one that rules and reigns. So Judah would have to stay as a tribe recognized until Messiah comes. That's why Judah couldn't stay in captivity in Babylon. Judah had to return to the land of Israel. She had to be in Israel as a tribe for Messiah to be presented through her tribe to have this, this scepter that would not depart until Shiloh came, until Messiah came. Okay, did I lose you? Came when he was a baby or came the second time? I believe came as a baby because 
he hasn't come the second time yet, and the scepter has departed. We'll see that. So I believe it's speaking of his first coming. Okay? Hang on with me, and if I don't fully answer it, ask me again. Okay, so what you're saying is, when they were settling, you know, after they left uh, Egypt, so he took the lead as far as the brothers, and he was the leader when they were fighting here, there, and everywhere? There were a number of tribes that were fighters, but we see the tribe of Judah is the one that produces king. Da well, Saul comes from Benjamin first, but David came from Judah, and David foreshadows Messiah. So they're going to be recognized as the royal tribe, the kingly tribe, the tribe that carried more authority. We see the 10 northern tribes go off into idolatry and to captivity with Assyria. And we have left Judah and Benjamin. And Benjamin, Benjamin was the little tribe. They were like the little brother. And Judah was the power, the ruler, the authority, the strength. And the name Judah stuck with, in fact, the name Jew comes from Judah. And, and when you hear uh, even like Netanyahu today say that the land is the land of Judea, Judea, Judah, his, his land, meaning more than just the tribal area, but he was seen as that royal tribe, as an authoritative tribe, as one that had power. And if he had stayed in captivity, that wouldn't be true for when Messiah came. But that scepter did not depart. Even when they were in captivity, they did not lose complete control and become assimilated. They kept their identity, that God kept a remnant, and God brought them back so that we have the tribe of Judah as a tribe when Messiah is living in his first coming on this earth. And they were looking for one to come from Judah to be their ruling king. They weren't looking for one to come from Naphtali or from Ashur or from uh, Benjamin or, or any of the other tribes. They were looking for one who would come through the tribe of Judah because they knew from the prophecies that's where our king will come from. So they're looking for Messiah to come from the tribe of Judah. Okay? Wheels are turning. <laughs> okay, let's go on a little bit here and see if it becomes clear as we talk about the whole prophecy. So we, we read that, that um, the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. Okay, that means there'll be a perpetual ruler. There would be one, and apparently Judah in some way was always being represented, even when they were off in captivity. They still must have recognized the, the tribe of Judah as, as heading them. Because remember when you're in captivity, it's not that they were all thrown into a, um, a prison. They were told even Jeremiah, Jeremiah, he said, when you're going, you're going to go into Babylon, you're into Babylon as captive. You're going to live there for 70 years. So build your houses, plant your gardens, settle down. Just accept this is what God says. He will bring you out. He will bring you back home. But they remained a people, just a people in captivity. So that's what, what is being referred to here is that Judah is going to keep that power. It's not going to go to another tribe. It's going to stay within Judah, and it will still be fulfilled through Judah's line. So keeping that in mind, when you look at this lawgiver, this perpetual ruler, this is the one who decrees. And apparently, um, I don't have it all, but if I could look through all of Israel's history, if I could follow all of the, the historical books, and it's overwhelming, Judah alone was the tribe that did remain distinct that did stay organized, they had political unity, and they did it all the way until 70 AD. They did it until the Messiah had come. Now, I'm looking at it as a believer in Messiah, in Yeshua Jesus as Messiah, who comes a first time and a second time. First time to be suffering servant, but he still is Messiah. And it's prophesied for him to come to suffer, to take care of the sin need. Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, and other places. I'm looking for him to be the same one who came then and dealt with the sin question to come the second time and fulfill the prophecies of the king that will sit on the throne of David, 1 Samuel 7, who will sit on that throne forever. So I'm looking for that greater fulfillment. I see both times and I see them both being given here. 
What's very interesting, and I think I brought this out at the end of class last week, I'm still trying to get more sources to prove it, but I'm having trouble finding sources that cover the early 80 years of Jewish history. Um, there, there are not many at my grasp. If I find more, I'll let you know. But I have no reason to detract or to take away from the source that was giving me Jewish history. It's a, it's a trustworthy source. Okay. It said clearly, and I, we all agree, many sources, that, that Jerusalem, so to speak, Israel, lost power completely in 70 AD, even though it took three times of revolt, finally in 136, to put all of Israel down, all the Jewish people down, even though Titus was thinking, I've taken them all back, you know, that were alive, the ones that I've left in the land are going to die off, they're old, they're beggarly, they're weakly, they're going to die off still, even though it took a little longer to see the effects everywhere. It is said that, that Israel, including Judah, lost power in 70 AD. Okay? No authority there now. The scepter is departed now. Okay? Question. Uh, does it say, the Bible say how old, uh, to, to what age he uh, lived? What age Yeshua lived? No. Uh, Judah? Judah. Judah. Uh, I could look on the timeline, but I don't. Nothing comes to mind right now that tells me Judah's age or a year that he died or something around that. Nothing's popping in my mind. Yeah, because most of the time it just says the, the bigger guys that let them out and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But. It doesn't. Yeah, like we know the, the years of Ezra and Nehemiah. Probably historically, I could probably open my big timeline and I could probably get the oh, years okay. of Judah. But do I have a scripture verse that says exactly no, not to my recall? Uh, it would be historical. Yeah, but I could get you later, I can get you right in the proximity of, of that time. Um, now, here's, here's what I'm drawing, what my point to come out. The Romans took some power from Judah at the time of messiah and they kept taking more and more power away they put in their puppet leaders that were to keep insurrections down if they didn't their heads would roll so believe me they tried to subjugate the people to keep them in control and that's the the israel that yeshua grew up in that rome had its thumb over israel they still had their chief priests, they still had their laws, they still had their rules, but remember when they wanted to cruise, well, sorry, but when they wanted to um, kill Yeshua, because to them, he had blasphemed himself by equating himself with God, that was no blasphemy because he was speaking truth. But they saw it as blasphemy, they wanted to put him to death, they took him to the Roman courts, that system to get him sentenced to death because they could not carry out capital punishment. Now, that's what my source said is the final um, point, I can't think of a better word, that as a people lose power, when power is completely gone is when they've lost the right to call out capital punishment or whatever you know they want to do. When they've lost that control, then they're considered a completely subjugated people. So at this time that they're wanting to call out Yeshua and cry out for his death and the time when he is put to death, notice he's not put to death by Jewish means. Jewish means he would have been stoned to death. That's what they did with blasphemers, took him outside the city and stoned them to death. So if he had been put to death by Jewish hands, it would have been in that manner. He was put to death on a Roman cross by the hands of the Romans who were carrying out the will of what the Jewish leadership wanted, the, the head leadership. I'm not saying every Jew, and I'm not condemning a whole people for the actions of some either. And let me get the point out clearly, no one is an exception from the, 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 the how do I say this? It's all our sins that brought crucifixion to Yeshua Jesus, who willingly gave his life. So there's no point in metzlinging. There's no point in pointing a finger. There's no point in saying, well, those bad Jews, they didn't accept their Messiah. You could also say those bad Romans carried out a bad plan and crucified him. But bottom line is he willingly laid down his life for Jew, for Roman, for Jew, for Gentile, 
Paul freely giving his life as he planned. He came to die. He was born to die. So no one took it out of his control. He willingly gave. Jesus even asked for them to be forgiven. Yes. Because yes. they know not what they do. So that kind of shows that they were trying to get rid of somebody that was causing them trouble. Right. But right. they didn't fully understand what they were doing. They did not. And if he was asking Jehovah in heaven to forgive them, what right do we have to condemn them? That we're putting ourselves right about Yeshua's it. will? But it fit right into what was supposed to happen. Oh, perfectly. To yep. the nth degree, yep. perfectly fit in. Yes, yes. So, so well put. And I had another thought that you brought out to me. Yeah, and, and that lost should it. show people that he didn't plan it, that Jesus didn't plan it, or anybody else like that. Because I mean, that's the wrong way to word it. Um, <laughs> you can't plan that well ahead of time if it's fake. If it's fake. If it's fake, then it was God's plan. Yeah. And Yeshua is carrying out the plan of God because that's his plan because he is God. And and he was, he did exactly what they thought he did. He declared himself to be God because he was. And that's why it wasn't blasphemous. But if, if any of us today had someone that we thought was blaspheming the name of the one we love, we want to stop them. We want to silence them. We don't want that to go out. And in fact, when we see it in the, false religions of mankind today that speak out against our savior it grieves us you know we we totally get that kind of response and we'd be quick in that same way also but again as ron just said they were carrying out the perfect plan of god without even knowing it without even knowing what they were doing but here's my point in bringing this out if the scepter was not to depart from Judah until shiloh came and the scepters departed even really before 70 AD because we see they're not being able to carry out capital punishment here in, let's just round it off, it's not as late as 40, but let's say 40 AD, then Messiah had to come before that point. He had to have been here. Now, what's very interesting is the source said that from the time of David, even through the Herods, there was a prince, a small leader over Judah. Remember, Judah had political control. Judah had rulership. That was the tribe that the others followed. They had that role. And it said that that um, this promise that Israel would keep the scepter until Shiloh came, that when in AD 6 or 7, somewhere around in there, in limited self-role, when they came to that point that they lost control, that the rabbis who had been studying these scriptures, that they saw this verse that we just read as unfulfilled. They saw that Judah had lost the scepter and they were mourning. They were going through the streets. They were depressed. They were, in essence, they were crying and they were saying, woe to us for the scepter has been taken away from Judah and Shiloh hasn't come. So it was breaking their hearts. They were thinking the word of God here had failed. They thought that it had been broken. But here's the interesting question. We see that, and Ron brought out earlier when we were talking about the amazing gift of God confining himself in human form, trusting himself in the vulnerability of an infant, having to grow in the knowledge of, of God and of who he was. We see, and I just lost my thought. Oh, okay. We see that by the time Yeshua was age 12, he had an understanding that he didn't have at age two. He was able to go into the temple. He was able to sit with the learned men, the ones who are studying the scriptures, these rabbis who were saying the, the, the Messiah has to come from Shiloh, has to come before the scepter leaves Shiloh. At age 12, he came into their midst. He confounded them with his ability to open up the scriptures and explain it to them and, and his understanding. And they, they marveled, and we know them more so as he comes into his public ministry in his early 30s and in those years that they often said he talks as one with authority. Well, break down the word authority. You get author. Who is the author of the word of God? Who better to speak about his own words than the one who wrote them, the one who is actively carrying them out? So here's the thought. Messiah came 
before that capital punishment was cut off, before the scepter was lost, presented himself as such in the temple. But sadly, the leaders of the temple scratched their heads, couldn't figure him out, didn't know what to do with them. And as they saw him in that early ministry, start to draw people to him instead of following them. Uh-oh. Now we don't like him. Now we have an issue. And it goes further to the point, like I say, where they thought he was blasphemous and they want to do away with him. But he he caused them a lot of grief because they were out of line before that. You see the Pharisees and the Sadducees come at Yeshua all the time. But I think this has to be so right on. That scepter didn't believe until Messiah had appeared. It didn't say until Messiah would die. It didn't say until a certain point just that he had to appear. And I fully believe scripture was fulfilled. These rabbis, the veil of blindness over their eyes were missing the truth. Hey, if that scepter has gone, then we need to look and see who was Messiah because he had to come by this point. Do we have one born in Bethlehem? Oh, yeah. Remember that young boy that spoke with great authority about the word of God? He was born in Bethlehem. But wait a minute, wait a minute, what line was he from? Was he from the tribe of Judah? And here's the records. Oh, he was from the tribe of Judah. And every other prophecy that had to be was proven by Yeshua if they would have only looked and seen. And I think, wow, does God dot every I and cross every T? Does he miss any detail? Not a one. The scepter did not depart as Genesis prophesied, until Messiah had come. Amazing. I got to go here first, you second. Go ahead. Okay. I'll let she goes first. Forgive my ignorance, but is this the first time that Sheol is mentioned for as Christ? Yes, yes. It's a prophetic word given. Sheila was a, a representative of the leader, the ruler. Some try to say, oh, it's a city. Really? When does a city rule? You know, we don't even say Washington, D.C. rules. We say the president rules. So Shiloh had to been a reference to. And it comes off of the, the term, the word um, shalom. It's out of the same root. So it's the peace giver, the peace giver. In fact, in fact, let me get right down to here because I've got it. I'll read you my notes here and then I'll get to you, Ron. Um, and this is according to Old Testament authorities, original covenant authorities, as well as those from the early church that Shiloh had to be a person, that it could not be a town, just as they even just said. And literally, it meant one who brings peace or one whose peace it is. So we can read that from the Hebrew to say, the scepter will not depart until he comes whose it is, until he comes whose right it is or to whom it belongs. So the scepter won't be cut off until the one who has the right to hold that scepter until he comes. That's what our Hebrews say in the word Shema. Okay, but uh, for the scepter, who gave that scepter and where does it come from? Uh, is it a, a symbol? or is It's it a symbol of the power. And it was handed to the tribe of Judah, to the Messiah of the tribe of Judah by God. So it would be the one who'd have that ruling authority, that ruling power, the one that they're still looking for to come in that kind of power. But yes, yes, that's what it's representing. What this is saying, you, you to your tribe is going to be the kingly tribe. It's going to be the king of kings is going to come from your tribe, and he's going to come before you don't have that scepter, before you lose rule because you've been raising up. Remember, David's from the tribe of Judah, and David was God's choice for king. It wasn't man's choice. Man chose Saul. Look where that went. God chose David. David was out of the tribe of Judah. When, when that tribe loses that rulership, that authority, that power, Messiah will have come. So right there, they need to look before, it may be as early as 6, 7 AD, but they definitely need to look before the time of crucifixion of Yeshua because the scepter had departed by that point. So he had to have already come. Amazing, amazing. So, Ron. So, I didn't have a question. I just had a comment. Sure. I keep having these, what I call, aha moments. Yeah. Uh -huh. Like when you read through the Bible, you just keep seeing new things every time. Right. I always thought of them misinterpreting who Jesus was during his ministry. Mm -hmm. 
this shows that they misinterpreted who he was from the time he was born. Right, right. And because look what even happened. When he, even during his ministry, they were questioning, well, we know where he came from and we know who his parents are. Right, right. So they knew who he was, but they were misinterpreting everything. And they did not believe in the virgin birth. They did not believe that Mary and Mary, his mother, had um, not had relations with someone to be found pregnant. They didn't follow any of their own prophecies. Like I say, he had to be born in, in Bethlehem. They left him. How did that happen? Joseph and Mary, Joseph and Miriam, were residents of Nazareth. They weren't residents of Beit Lechem. But a decree went out. First time there'd been a decree like this. You have to go back to where your family originated from. And both Joseph and Mary, Miriam, their family relations came from David came from the town of David, came from Beit Lechem. So even that prophetically showing God at work, planning it, saying, this is how you can identify him. There were so many fingerprints to identify. They should have known who he was. And looking back, especially if they will handle the word of God with open eyes and honesty, there's no one else that fits it. No one else that can be. So I do have a question that maybe can't be answered. But so they they figured that Shiloh had not come like six or seven AD. AD. Right. These do rabbis you think that at that point that's when they stopped trying to look at it the right way. And maybe they already figured it had been messed up so they were more really focusing on the details that would have pointed out that that's who it was. That's a good question. I don't yeah, might know. People that might have been searching for, for him might have stopped looking. Might have given up, might have thought there isn't going to be, it might have been a moment of defeat. We know the Pharisees and the Sadducees already were, were twisting scripture and taking it to their leadership and their following. The Pharisees at least believed in an afterlife. The Sadducees didn't even believe in that. And they were the leaders. We see already what I see today. Sadly, our, our Jewish people that are religious, okay? And I put that word in quotes, but the ones that, that are religious, that, that go to synagogue or temple, which already tells you how religious they are because to the Orthodox, there's only one temple, the one that belongs in Jerusalem. So their places of, of worship are, are called synagogues, and the synagogue was to be a house of prayer. It was where they were to continue on praying when they lost the temple. That's when synagogues began to develop in other areas. But point still being, they already were not looking at the Word of God. They were already were arguing among themselves and arguing against what they thought and what they believed and getting people to follow them. And that's why this Yeshua, with his the way, which is what they first called believers, they're of the way. And the way was, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me, which Yeshua declared to them very clearly. You want to go to Yehovah? You want to meet Yehovah? You want to know and have relationship with Yehovah? It only comes through me. But these others already were tangents. They were already moving away from the scriptures and into man's, that. yes, there was already confusion and in man's interpretation. Two things is clearly if you've already got that confusion. Right, really right. And if you don't study the word of God, that's what comes from it. And Satan may have clouded them, deceived them, confused them, and absolutely. Still didn't stop what was supposed to happen. But it right. still could have helped them not right. see it. Right. And honestly, I think Satan thought he was getting victory. I think he thought at crucifixion he had victory. I think, to put it in today's vernacular, someone said at once that, that Satan was dancing for three days. You know, I think he thought he was winning. He just played right into the hand of God and brought it right around his greatest defeat. Fulfilling the prophecy of Genesis 3.15, that the hill where Messiah touched the earth would be crushed, but that hill would crush his head, which is the death blow. He was proving it, but he thought, and he still thinks, the audacity how he could think he's still going to overrule God, take control yeah. of this world, yeah. and sit he's, on the throne. He's probably like those spiritual leaders looking at it in a confused way. Yes, and, and completely away from what God said. He still has that pride within him that says, I can dethrone God's plan. So even if God wrote it down and it's here, it's not going to happen.
As someone once said to me, you know, don't you think that God could still turn Israel around and Israel right now today with what's going on, she'll open up her eyes, she'll see, she'll believe, she'll cry out, and the, the Messiah can come without the tribulation period, without all these things happening. And I said, no, that can't happen. And they were appalled, I guess, that I would say no, but I said, it's already been foretold that this will happen. So to have it change would mean that God didn't keep his word. If God said there's a time coming of Jacob's trouble, and suddenly that goes away and there is no time of Jacob's trouble, then I'm in trouble. Because everything I believe that God said is promised, is sure, and is true, and is for eternity, I'd have to say, well, God could change his mind or his plan on that. But he doesn't. He never does. He carries out his word exactly how he said it from beginning to end of our time and past us from eternity past to eternity future that we can't even comprehend. There will come a time where they will see. Yes. But that's in prophecy. Yes. Yes. It prophetically they will. They will yes. mourn for the one when they see him and realize you have been here. We see the nail prints. We know who you were. That's it's a, a bittersweet moment because they realize what they've missed, but they're finally embracing the truth. And that will go forward into the kingdom. So this is a huge prophecy. It is so specific. Not only did he have to come out of the tribe of Judah, but he had to come before Judah lost that authority. And he did. And maybe he, that if Judah even lost authority, the year Yeshua was in the temple showing who he was, in a way if they had been open to, they would have followed. But sadly, they did not. I'm sure they dismissed him. Oh, he's a kid. He's just a child. He's wet behind the ears. What does he know? That they had to have wondered in their hearts because he had to have been explaining it in a way that they had to be saying, you know, he's got an understanding. That goes beyond his years. Where did he get his training? He's not been a rabbinical school. He's not been in our, uh, today we'd say our universities. You know, who did he sit under? Who's, whose follower is he? Because remember, they all had their followers. You know, they all had their leaders. Yeah. And he wasn't he one of them. Yes, he wasn't in their, this is where you got to come from. from. Yes, yeah. Yeah, it is just, I don't know anything to use to describe how it would be because I don't want to take it into the political, but it would be as if you take our, our main political parties, all of them, including our independents, and all of a sudden someone comes out from a whole different place and outshines all of these. You know, it's like, wait a minute. You're not one of ours. We, no, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a threat to them themselves also. But again, this prophecy is so huge and so amazing. When you stop and think where we are in history, stop and think we are in the book called Beginning. We haven't even gotten out of the beginning. We're right there early with the tribes that haven't even gone yet into the land and conquered and had their land. And we have all of this prophecy about each one of these sons and how every part of it comes true. We already saw how Shimon and uh, Levi were scattered. I forgot to bring out the Levitical didn't get land. They got cities, 48 cities throughout Israel, but they got cities in, in all of the other tribes to set up their rulership, uh, sorry, not their rulership, the, the priestly work in those cities. They were given pasture lands so that the path their, their animals could be fed, but they didn't have to go out and work outside of doing their priestly work. They were given and, and they, they um, existed from the ties from the people and so forth and so on. So everything is being fulfilled exactly. But this was so, I mean, write a book, people. <laughs> write a book pick a people tell what they're going to be like give them 12 sons each son different tell what it's going to be like through their tribe through all of time wow wow anybody who says this book was written by man really how did man get that how could man tell something like this prophecy that that if we even take it where are we right now um Let's just call it 2500 BC. I think I'm safe there. No, 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 because we're in Egypt. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We're in Egypt. We're, we're about 1800 BC. Okay. 
just approximate, because they come out in 1445 approximately, and they're there 400 years. So I know we're at, at 1800, okay? 1800 BC, 1800 years before Sheila would come, and that would happen before they lose the scepter. Just that part alone, let alone jumping another 2000 years from zero AD to 2024 now, and saying what's going to happen yet prophetically. And I'll tell you, I'm as sure of every detail of that as I am that every detail was fulfilled up until that point. Just because God wrote it. God set it in motion. God put the plan out there. The Holy and Spirit. Yes, the Holy Spirit, God, you show all involved. And nothing can turn it away. So even in this prophecy, um, and did I tell you too, I don't think I did, between his feet, that expression there, um, when they, when the king would have his scepter and he would come to sit on his throne, whether it was being publicly seen or even uh, in the palace, but they would take that scepter, they would put it, when they sat on the throne, they would put it down between their feet, pointing toward them. That's where the power was. So even in that phrase, they came to carry it out in that way. But God knew before there was even a, an earthly king how they were going to be. He put it in them to do it. In in in, in other words, um, what else haven't I brought out to you? Maybe that's it as far as where we've gotten so far. Um, that was the verse of the prophecy in that period. Yes, the yes, letter. yes. Letter. We haven't totally finished it. Let's go back and look at it. Um, yeah. We are. We've gone through the lion. We've gone through the scepter now that it wouldn't. Um, depart from between his feet. Even that was so picturesquely exactly fulfilled that that's where they put the scepter, was right there between their feet. And then it wouldn't happen until Shiloh comes. I already told you how Shiloh comes out of the root from Shalom, the one who brings peace, but the one who, who the scepter belongs to, the ones who is the, the one um, whose right it is, the one to whom it belongs. All of that is what comes out of our Hebrew meaning for that word. And to him, Notice also that makes Shiloh a person. To him shall be the obedience of the peoples or the gathering of the people you may have. And in the second coming of Messiah, all the Jews will be gathered to Yerushalayim. They'll be in obedience because that word gathering and the word obedience are also the same root. So when it's saying they're gathered to him, they're coming in obedience. They're being obedient to him. And we know the picture of millennial reign is Messiah on the throne not only Israel worshiping Messiah, which is to be expected, but all the other nations also come up. If they don't come up when they're supposed to, bring their first fruits and, and other sacrifices to the Lord. It says that their country will not receive rain. If they don't get rain, they can't have crops. If they can't have crops, they're going to have a time of famine. Oh, I think I better get up there and follow what the Lord said. So they're going to come out of obedience. They're going to all be gathered together. And we have not seen that. We'll see that in the millennial time. So again, the prophecy that goes on to the end. And verse 11 and 12 are explaining what it will be like in that millennial time, because that's what we're looking to now. We're looking to that second coming time. He ties his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washes his garments in wine and his robe, robes sorry, in the blood of grapes. His eyes are dull from wine and his teeth white from milk. Okay, I don't need to say anything. Y'all understand that, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. What does it mean? Actually, it's a paradise-like picture. It's a picture of splendor. It's a picture of non-lack. It's a picture of a very productive land, a very fruitful land. The picture of vines is that the vines are so flourishing and the grapes are so abundant that the conquering rider, he could ride his horse up to those vines. And you know how they'll tie the horse up at, at whatever you call that? He could do that to the branches of the grapes. They'd be able to hold that horse there while they went off to do whatever because the the vines were that luscious and that strong and that big and that, that plentiful. That's what it's a picture of. It's overflowing with all of all of these grapes, all of this plenty, wine so plentiful that if man wanted to, 
He can wash his clothes in the wine. He doesn't have to worry about just saving it for the, the drink to enjoy with his dinner. Oh, I've got so much, I can go take a bath in it if I want to. That's basically what it's saying in this picture. They could wash their clothes in it, and the wine presses were so full that when they got into the wine press to stomp on the grapes, it was splattering all over them because it was plentiful. It wasn't little itty bitty grapes and they were trying to get what they could out of them. It was squish, squish, splash, splash. It was all over them. They were being covered with it. That's a picture of prosperity. That's Yuda's uh, portion that the vines would grow like this. And well, coincidentally enough, when we get into where Yuda was, that tribal area, was the area where the vines do grow in that type of um, of um, farming type area. It was um, the district in the south of Canaan. And when we read in Song of Songs, and I'll just tell you this in your cross references, but Song of Songs, chapter one and verse 14, it talks about the vineyards of Engedi, and that was in Judah's portion. So Song of Songs, Song of Solomon is talking about the grapes in Judah's area. Here's Judah's prophecy that the grapes would be so full and so plenteous that they could tie their horses up to it. They could bathe in it. They could drink all they wanted. They could be just splashing in it. They had so they much. Drunken. <laughs> yeah, they were <laughs> drunken. Now, let's take that also because often we have the shadow, the foreshadowing in the greater picture like we've been seeing. Let's take that also to Messiah's second coming. And let's look at some of the verses that are in reference to this that tie in with the Battle of Armageddon. Let's go. That's where you went. <laughs> Good for you. Good like for the, you. Like the garments and the wine. And exactly. The exactly. Yes. Going? We're going to Isaiah 63 as soon as we're shopping, get our tablet to work. <laughs> it, it's It's me. It's not my tablet, it's me. There we go. Isaiah 63, and we're going to read verses 1 through 3. Um, and yes, we've seen the beautiful picture of the wine, but there's also this other picture. So in chapter 63 and verse 1, it says, Who is this who comes from Edom with garments of glowing colors from Bozrah? This one who is majestic in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I who speaks in righteousness, mighty to save. So who's speaking? The Lord. The Lord's only one mighty to save and who speaks in righteousness, period. No question who's speaking. So the question's asked of him, why is your apparel red? Why are your garments like the one who treads in the wine press? And his answer, verse three, I have trodden the wine trough alone. From the peoples, there was no man with me. I tr also trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath, and their life blood is sprinkled on my garments, and I'm stained, uh, and I stain all my raiment. Verse four also, for the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption has come. So what the Lord is saying is when I come in judgment, righteous judgment, I'm coming treading those wine press. I'm coming. And their blood is going to be splattered all over, staining the garments, uh, even the garment he's wearing, because he's coming at that battle of Armageddon. He's coming when it says the blood would be as high as a horse's bridle. He's putting a stop to that. But even as he comes treading those wine presses, as it comes down through Israel, coming to the point of the Mount of Olives where he's going to set up in victory, even there we see the blood being splattered like wine and a picture of it being like the wine presses that were exploding, but this time it's in blood. Revelation 14, starting with verse 14. Revelation 14 and verse 14, where we read there also. Then I looked and behold a white cloud and sitting on the cloud was one like the son of man having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. The sickle is what you reap with in the, the vineyards. Another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap, for the hour has, to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now this is judgment. This is the sickle coming down, the sword coming down in judgment over the earth. In verse 17, another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also had a sharp sickle. And then another angel, the one who has power over fire, came from the altar. And he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, put in your sharp sickle 
gather the clusters from the vines of the earth, the grape clusters, because her grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth, gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth, and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. This is not just joy now. This isn't the wine that they're going to bathe in. This is God treading through their, their countries in this judgment, and the blood is coming out. Um, the wine press was trodden outside the city. Blood came out from the wine press up to the horse's bridle for a distance of 200 miles. When Yeshua returns, he returns in judgment. The enemy goes down in defeat. There is a bloodbath that takes place, but Yeshua is victor. So um, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. So what I'm getting a vision of, this is blood for the remission of the sins of all the sinners. It's almost like, I'm not saying it cleanses them, but it's right. almost like right. they, since they didn't allow Jesus' blood it's to cover their them, blood. And now they get to have their blood. Right, and it's going to be their judgment rather yeah. than their salvation. So it's because like it's these are blood, the enemies. But since they wouldn't accept Jesus' blood. Yeah, it's not sinless it blood. blood. And it's not sinless, so it can't save them. Right. It's, it but it's still payment. Cost of, I'm sorry? It's still maybe payment for their sin. Well, the wages of sin is death. They're, they're having to give up their blood. Yeah, the wages of sin is death. So in that sense, I could see it and say it. But otherwise, it's just such a horrendous uh, picture of judgment. Uh, yes. yes, yes, because blood is required, and they would not accept his. So I can see what you're saying. I hadn't thought to put it there before, but I can see what you're saying. I would just make very clear that it was... Um, it doesn't cleanse them. Right, it doesn't cleanse them. Yes, yes. And he's coming in wrath. He's coming in judgment. He's been pouring out his wrath on the earth for seven years, not just three and a half years, folks. Three and a half years, it, it gets even worse. But for all seven years, his wrath has been being poured out. And here's the culmination and the blood that is being shed because it is their judgment is up to the horse's bridle. Horrendous, horrendous. It goes along also with Revelation 19, 12 and 13, which says, his eyes are a flame of fire. On his head are many diadems. He has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. So we know who he is. And the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. Okay, I read even one more verse than I intended to. Um, but that shows the contrast. It shows we have escaped that time. We're already clothed in the right robe of righteousness, which we receive when we enter heaven and come before his beam of seat for reward and loss of reward, not for salvation or lack thereof. You don't get into heaven without salvation. It's not a judgment for salvation. So here we come back with him and we're in white. We're not covered in blood, our own blood, the judgment. We are the ones that are redeemed, we are the ones that have our salvation paid for in the blood of Yeshua. But look at how he's coming, his robe dipped in blood. Because he, he's the one that gets, um, I, I can't say, I can't say the Lord gets dirty in battle, but you know what I'm trying to say. He's the one that, that takes it on. We don't fight the enemy when we come back with him. We're his cheering squad coming back with him. We're watching him and saying, whoa, go. You know, and we're just, he just, he just, wow. Yeah, he doesn't need our help. He doesn't need our help. No, no, he doesn't need our help at all. So again, we see what a contrast in those pictures, that what the, the wine and all of that could represent from the first coming and also from the second coming, what we could see. And then in millennial reign, it will be a beautiful picture. It won't be this horrible, horrible picture of war that, and devastation that we see here. And in this prophecy also, there we go, um, the, the showing the prosperity that was spoken of in verse 12. I think I already read it to you. Yeah, his eyes are dull from wine. Um, actually, you could say a, a better word, I think, for our understanding they were sparkling with the wine that that they when they had that all that prosperity and all that that will see them enjoy in millennial reign 
that's more what this is saying. It's not meaning that they're they they're you know under the stupor and they can't see clearly. We take that because that's how we look at dull. That's why it's lost its meaning over time with us. How we see it, the better would be to say that they were sparkling. Think of the spark in the eye; they're coming alive and they're you know just abundantly being blessed. And that fits with the expression the teeth white from milk. That's speaking of their health. They are so healthy. So we can even see a double blessing in this. Yuda being divinely blessed and the picture of prosperity during the millennium when the, the land really will flow with milk and honey, when it will be more so than even what Yuda entered into in, in time here under Yahshua in the first time they came into the promised land. So huge prophecy. We'll spend more time on Yudas, and we'll go through others quickly. Yosef will spend a little bit of time on also, but huge prophecy for us to, to be able to absorb this whole picture. We've got to see, I believe, both the early and the latter fulfillments, the smaller and the greater fulfillments, and see it in all it is. So I definitely spent time here feeling this is important to us and to see what all is being said. And it just amazes me, again, the accuracy of God's word. I know we're short on time. I think I can do Zebulun in just a moment. I just want to contrast it. You see how much greater with Yuda. So let me do Zebulun. It's only verse 13, and we'll stop there for today. Then I believe we'll finish all the prophecy next week and go into chapter 50. I believe we will. <laughs> I never will say it dogmatically, but quite likely. Zebulun will dwell at the seashore. He shall be a haven for ships, and his flanks shall be toward Sidon or Sidon. <clears throat> Excuse me, depending on your, your pronunciation. When it says that he'll reside at the seashore or dwell at the haven of the sea, um, Roger, while I'm telling this, why don't you go ahead and pull up that map picture that I gave you for today and keep it for next week because we'll see it more with the tribes next week also. Um, but it, yes, there you go. We want to look for Zebulon, so you got it. Um, Go toward the sea, go up, there you go. Whoops, up, 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 you are there, you are. See Zebulun there? And the Mediterranean Sea on the left, okay? That's the area that we're going to be talking about for Zebulun. I should have shown Yudas territory. So if you want to go back down, right there, all that green because it's lush and pasture type, you know, all of that. And Getty, I mentioned, you can see it um, right there on the Dead Sea. We mentioned that, that the grapevines were so prolific there. Uh, and we talked, of course, Yeshua and Messiah coming from Bethlehem of the tribe of Judah. That's Judah's territory. But now going up and looking at Zebulon, it's interesting because it says he'll live toward the seashore. Well, he was. He wasn't right on the seashore, but he lived toward the seashore. And they were a seafaring and a commercial tribe. If you want the parameters exactly, and it just gives it in names that you won't understand, read Joshua 19, 10, and 11. I'm just, I give you that reference just so you know where we get how to draw the map because the, the scripture gives those references. They were definitely on the northern part of Israel, and really they went more, that looks like they're quite a distance from the sea, but really they were just about a sea coast people. And it's very interesting that that's the name given to Zebulon, that he would reside at the seashore, and that is where they settled. Um, because remember, when they came into the land, lots were cast for the land and, and where they ended up. But, but God had already prophetically told Zebulon would be near the seashore. Once again, we just see that fulfillment. He'd be a harbor or haven for ships. Haifa is in Zebulon's territory today. That's why really this map I don't think is 100% accurate because Haifa is closer to where Dor is. It, it, Haifa is um, on, the, on the coastline, right? Yeah, you, there you go. There you go. Um, Haifa, if you look on a map, you'll see the little bend of, of Israel that comes out. It's Haifa on one side and Offer on the other, but it, it is the seaport. The U.S. 6th Fleet docks at Haifa. You can take a ship and come into Israel at Haifa. So that's the area that is Zebulon's territory, and it comes prophetically true. Um, it's, it's upward or down? I mean, you know, Zebulon like, should be wider than they're showing. It should be, yeah, covering a yeah, I would make that pink go a little larger, and I would make Manasseh's Manasseh's a little less of the gold right there at the top. I would have taken the pink and gone almost all the way 
really can even go all the way to the coast. No, but I mean, you know, is it towards like like the Dead Sea or? Is it oh, it's about Dead Sea is down south. See the Sea Galley. Dead Sea is all the way down here. Okay. Oh. You got your Sea Galley in the north. You've got the Dead Sea in the south. You've got the Jordan River that connects. The, the water comes out of the, the Sea Galley, flows down, goes into the Dead Sea, but there's no outlet. That's why it ends up all the sediment and everything makes it a, quote, Dead Sea. Uh, but yes, yes, Zebulon is in the territory of Galilee, um, that area, um, and sure. Naphtali's there also. Yeah, is Haifa that little dipped-in area above door? Cause yeah. Because that's, that's what I remember on yeah. map it, is that area that looks like a dipped-in there. And it should above. be a little more dipped, yes. Yeah. That's what I was trying to say, so yes, that's and when why. When we were there, yeah, it's a huge port. It is, it's all absolutely yeah. is, yes. Huge. Yes, and I even saw the sign and snapped a picture. Um, Israel welcomes the U.S. Sixth Fleet. That is, and our Sixth Fleet is there right now to be ready to defend Israel. That's what they did in the 80s also. They're there again. So, uh, yeah. um, but definitely, yes, I would put a little butt door, but that area, and it's a little more predominant of a, you yeah. know, than that map shows. And this is to the left of that area right there. Yes, yes, yeah. in that area, yes. You didn't have a word. I'm just thinking where, where the, the bridge they just built the, the oh that that fort no that fort no that's that that's was, higher up that's higher up than that yeah I believe yeah I'm sure it is I'm positive it is it's higher up yeah okay what's interesting and why I want to bring it out right now real quickly too Zebulon and Naphtali you see Naphtali also gets the area of Galilee that's the green right there they're both in the area that became known as the Galilee of the Gentiles. I'll pick this back up next week also because I know I lose some people by this time in class. But Matthew 4, 13, and 15 refer to the Galilee of the Gentiles. So these tribes, Naphtali and Zebulun in particular, we'll talk about a sure later, but these two, they mingled freely with others from the other nations. And it's interesting, 11 out of the 12 of the apostles came from the Galilee area. Judas was the only exception. All the others came from this area, from the area of Galilee. Oh, well, okay. I don't know, but he's a different character too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it is interesting. Um, and it's interesting also, again, I'm going to come back and talk a little bit more. I should know I couldn't do it as fast as I think. I'll talk a little bit more about uh, Zebulon and his power in this area. But And I just dropped my phone. Oh, oh, what's interesting is Judah was the fourth set. Okay, we've seen them in order. We saw it talk about Reuben, Shimeon, Levi, and then Judah. Okay, that was in order. Zebulon is number 10. Why did he get jumped up here? And it's possibly, only possibly, but it's possibly because Judah is bringing out, this is where Messiah comes from. And when he came in his first coming, he spent the majority of his time in this territory, in Zebulon and Naphtali's territory. So it may be why it was just connected is here we're talking about Messiah in his first coming and his second coming. Oh, let me tell you, in his first coming, he's going to be a, a lot in the area of Zebulon. So I'll tell you now about Zebulon and I'll give you Zebulon's prophecy. Just a thought, because we don't get Naphtali's there yet, but but Zebulon had more of the territory than Naphtali had, I believe, too, even though that map makes it look a little smaller. I'd have to go back and look at my numbers to make sure I'm right on that. That could be a misspoken. But anyway, can't tell you that dogmatically. It's just curious that we were going in order, and all of a sudden we jumped down to number 10. But he definitely had a greater role in the life of Messiah, and we're looking at Messiah, so I think it might be just carrying the thought through. Okay, we'll close there. We'll pick back up with a little bit more on Zebulon and his territory. And then, like I say, the others, until we get to Yosef, we'll move rapidly through Yisachar, through Don or Dan, through God or Dad, however you want to pronounce these names, um, and Ashur and Naphtali. They're still a very interesting, very good prophecies. Um, but then Yosef will stop a little longer in Yosef. So that might be next week's lesson. Yeah, we'll probably at least get through Benjamin. Benjamin. Uh, but I'll tell you what, I'll, t I'll tantalize you with this. When we get through with the 12 tribes, I'll go back and I'll show you just in an overview that I can do very quickly. But I'll show you that the 12 tribes do portray Messiah, his characteristics, his ministry, 
and his salvation. We see that all from the 12 tribes. Very, very interesting. Okay, let me close in prayer fast for those who need to scoot can, and then we'll open it for questions and discussion to continue. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that we can even see in your prophecies your perfect fulfillment to every detail and for how that builds our faith and our trust in you for all that you have promised yet to come. Lord, may we be quick to share this with those around us, especially, Lord, may Israel hear there is a future. There is a hope. The hope is for Messiah who will return, who will rule and reign. The salvation is still available to the Jew and to the Gentile. Lord, use us to spread the good news, and may we spread it both in Israel and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Thank you for this time. Now, just, Lord, to help us, help it to become a part of us, that we don't become forgetters, that we are hearers and doers of your word, all to your glory, in your holy name. Amen.